The conference has been locked.
I know, I know, I know. <laughs> well, I know about that, but uh, hopefully, hope to be able to stay awake. <laughs> hopefully. Uh, thank you. So thank you, everybody, um, for coming, first of all, and um, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I'm really very grateful for your interest in mental health, and the sense of mental health innovations is just terrific. You know, I think that, um, again, uh, mental health and the importance of mental health is coming in increasingly aware throughout the healthcare system. So it's great to have this. It's great to have all your great minds. And I'm going to go through lots of slides, but pretty quick, just to give you a like 20,000 foot mm -hmm. overview of the kinds of things that we do um, in the Office of Mental Health and some of the things that we emphasize. And then I really like to spend some real time questions and answers and any ideas that you may have about what we can be doing better. So moving forward, I always start with this because even though the ACA has fallen into a certain amount of just uh, disarray um, in the current administration. I think the philosophy behind it um, is something that we continue to use at the Office of Mental Health, and I think that healthcare generally is using, which is the transformation of our system of care from what um, in the past has been a real emphasis on the acute treatment of illness. And if you think about it, I think um, if you go back in time, I got this gray hair for a reason. When I, you know, 20 years ago, Health plans didn't pay for mammograms. They didn't pay for them. And why didn't they pay for them? Because you weren't sick yet. And we only have to pay for things when you get sick. So the whole concept of prevention and wellness really wasn't in the world of what healthcare should be paying for. And that's been an evolution. And because it's part of the culture, it's still a bit of a struggle within our current healthcare system to make that as important as it needs to be. Um, when you think about the spend expenditures for health care, you know, they always say that the U.S. spends an enormous amount on health care. But if you break it down and you say what we spend for acute care and you add from what other countries spend and you add in what they spend on wellness to acute care, they don't, most of the industrialized nations spend just about what we spend. They just spend it differently. They spend a fair amount on wellness and prevention more than we do, and, but they also spend it on acute care as well. Now, the theory here is, which is what's the theory of the, this triple aim, is that if you do a lot more on the prevention and wellness side, maybe you need a little less in that middle bar. And so you can spend the same amount of money to spend it differently and have people more functional. So that's the overall idea. The second part is better care. And here's where we struggle, I think, all the time in mental health, but in all things, to really do the very best care, evidence-based care, care that you know you're getting the right outcomes for. And then lastly, you have to be kind of cost-conscious. Um, partly because money isn't, there isn't enough money for everything, and partly because out of your paycheck comes health care benefits. And when they go up, you know, as much as you might think all the great things about health care, it bothers you when you start paying more. And so when the state starts paying more and more for Medicaid, it's also a concept of how do we pay it? Are we paying it in the right way? Are we spending money the right way? So those are the ideas. Now, I'm, not, I'm going to go through, I'm not going to go through this slide, but this is the long list. So the slides are going to talk about these. And this is the population health stuff that we're trying to do at the Office of Mental Health. Some of it is bigger than others, but the, pro <clears throat> the idea here is that we need to be thinking more about prevention, early prevention, and prevention of um, primary prevention, which I'm going to talk about, which is largely done in schools and pediatric practices. Secondary prevention, which is when you get, you know that there's an illness, you want to find it. So that's our screening and collaborative care, first episode psychosis. So I'll go through some of this. Better care for each patient means that we really and truly integrate care. And I'll talk a little bit more about this as we go on. What does integrated care mean? Um, it means that you consider the mind and the body together kind of all the time. And I can honestly say that for many years, we were pretty siloed. The mind people were here and the body people were here. And they really didn't work too well together. And that was a part of both systems being a problem. So all collaborative care, integrated care, primary care with mental health, mental health and primary care all integrated care. And then the last thing is always being conscious of cost. Okay. One, two slides just on the public system in New York State, just so you get an idea of us. The public mental health system treats about 700,000 individuals a year. So it's a big system. Um, we have 7,000 inpatient beds. That includes my state beds. I'm telling you that's huge. You look across the country, you don't see inpatient beds like that anywhere else. And preserving that, personally, I think is important. 
Um, but it's not easy to preserve it because there's always a push to kind of, in some ways, not have as many inpatient beds. Um, if you do it right, we could probably have less, but we have to do it right to do so. There's 4,500 public providers, lots of outreach, crisis, respite. CPEP's a comprehensive psychiatric emergency program. Um, we have over 20 of those across the state. These are big, they're important, um, they're not everywhere. And then we run, um, this is the state system. We still have 2,700 civil beds in the state system. That includes adults and kids. Um, I would say half of those beds are doing the kinds of things we really want our beds to be doing, which is what we call intermediate care, where individuals come and stay with us maybe for three months to six months, maybe to a year, a little bit more, until they can really be stabilized to go back out into the community. And the other half are legacy of institutionalization of individuals who are in our state system for sometimes five years, 10 years. We have a cohort that's even 20 years or more. We have decreased that cohort dramatically by several hundred beds in the past couple of years, but it's very difficult because it's part of, I think, what our system has done in the past, which was kind of help people become a little bit too institutionalized. So there's a massive movement, and I'm not going to talk too much more about it, but a massive movement in the state to move individuals into the community. And that means housing, jobs, um, working in the community, not becoming um, the long-stay patients that we've seen in the state hospitals in the past. So I'm making a little bit of a plug here because you'll all see a lot of times you'll read in newspapers, well, why don't you have more state hospital beds? You know, if you had more state hospital beds, you would solve the problems of the homeless, you would solve the problems. I'm telling you, state hospital beds should be there for individuals who need them for a limited period of time. We should not be saying to the mentally ill, we just want you back in asylums, out of our view, and something we don't have to deal with. So, the location of the 2,700 All across the state. So you've is got in the city. Or are they really spread over? They're all over the state. We have 24 hospitals still, 24 bricks and mortar hospitals. The largest concentration of beds is still in the city, but that's because there's population sitting in the city. But it's pretty much spread out. New York, Buffalo, St. Lawrence, up on the Canadian border. Um, uh, um, Syracuse, Long Island. New York City um, state hospitals are still there. The biggest ones are now probably about three to 400 beds. The smallest are maybe 80 beds. So there's a range. Yep, yeah. St. Lawrence is um, right across from Toronto, northern New York, one of the most rural sections of northern New York. Um, so they're really out. Uh, we have one called um, uh, one of the, the Valley, I forget the first name, Valley, Hudson Valley. That's right in the middle of, you know, a section in western New York, very rural. Then we have some in the cities, some smaller cities, Rochester, um, Binghamton, um, Elmira, not the big city. Um, and then we have others on, in, in rural sections. So they're all over. Less than there used to be. Um, again, just to give you a sense of what the system was, um, in the 1960s, 70s, there were 90,000 individuals in the state hospital system in New York State, just in New York State, 90,000 individuals. The funny thing about that number, though, is it did include, we didn't have nursing home systems then. You know, remember the Medicare, Medicaid came when? The 60s. So when people talk about the massive number of beds before, and they never count this, when they say beds you have now, the beds you had in the past, those beds were really doing <clears throat> a lot of dementia a lot of um, what in those days were chronic syphilis cases that were still in the state system, um, a lot of brain disorders which never should have been in state hospitals. So those 90,000 beds probably up to a third to maybe a little bit more than a third which should never, were, were really should never have been in the state hospital, but there's nothing else in those days. And with Medicare and Medicaid, you began to have a public way to finance other than state dollars. So, <clears throat> okay. And we see about 30,000 outpatients as well. Um, that's a clinic system. All of those clinics are attached in some way to the state hospital system, and they serve across the state the most seriously mentally ill. And just one more plug before I get into some of our um, preventive stuff. You know, um, the clients that come in now to our state hospital system are some of the sickest individuals. They're, well, if you think about it for a minute, they're individuals who the acute care system has had difficulty treating, and they now come to the state hospital system. So it's kind of, I like to call it the ICUs of uh, psychiatry. So we have some challenging patients. It's wonderful to work with challenging patients, just like it's wonderful for cardiologists to work with 
challenging patients and everyone else in medicine. So it's wonderful to work with them, but it's very hard work. And then when they leave, they're often still not as functionally capable as some other groups. So they need lots of support, they need lots of acceptance by the community, and they also need lots of outpatient care. So we do have an outpatient system that serves those seriously mentally ill because to some extent other pieces of the system are not up to it, to be quite honest. So I think that, um, well, for example, we do tons of clozapine. If you know medications, clozapine is one of the drugs that probably should be used more and more in psychiatry, but it requires certain special blood tests and a certain facility to use it. A lot of people are still a little reluctant to use clozapine. We use tons of clozapine in our outpatient services and our inpatient services because our docs are specialists in doing that kind of work. So there's a lot of really very <coughs> creative work that goes on with some of the most challenging patients. And but, but the vast majority of these patients, we can get back into the community. And that's terrific. They can get housing, they can wraparound services, they can do really, really well. So it's having the right balance of community services and the right balance of beds. And I don't know that we're there yet, but we're getting there. And we have, um, I'll be talking about it later, we have over 43,000 housing units across the state. Um, so seriously mentally ill probably need another 20,000, 5,000 to have enough. But that's enormous number of beds relative to any other state in the union. Okay. <clears throat> so we're a provider regulator and we fund, <coughs> we send $800 million in state aid to counties to do all the kinds of outpatient work. And we send a whole bunch of money to New York City as well. And then the city funnels that money into a variety of providers and a variety of services. So there's a, almost a billion dollars in state aid that goes out to the counties for mental health services. Okay, so this is what we're doing in prevention. And I think if you're a child person or you've done much, you know about the ACEs studies and you know the, the um, <clears throat> what's fascinating about these is that they've been done a long time ago. And it's a, well, it takes a long time for things to penetrate in the kinds of academic research and the kind of stuff you guys see to the actual practice, getting it into practice. And these studies have been around a while, but the ACEs studies clearly show that if, that if you um, have certain experiences as a child, which you think is kind of common sense, but was shown by very good studies, emotional abuse, physical abuse, sex abuse, and you begin to have one or more of these, you begin to increase the chances for lifetime issues in terms of substance use, mental health issues, but what else? Physical health issues. And when they even took the substance use out of it and said, well, you know, obviously you have physical health issues if you use substance independent of that, there's physical problems. So you get heart disease, you get pulmonary disease, you get other kinds of illness. So the reality is, in your healthcare system, if you're smart, what do you do? You worry about all these things as much as you worry about your vaccinations, and you worry about your healthy child visits and your healthy adolescent visits, and you worry about all the other things, the diabetes and the hypertension. You should be worrying about all this just as much because its impact is just as great. But it's very hard to actually put that into the mindset of the way we finance. And that goes back to that initial triple aim. So the push here is to begin to use <clears throat> this kind of data and these kinds of things to show that we have to put the kind of preventive services in here like we do for mammograms, for breast cancer, like we do for, you know, for um, colon cancer. That we have the same concept that preventing this kind of thing prevents future problems in healthcare. Okay, this is just going into trauma-informed care, a huge piece of all this. Okay, so what do you do then? Well, you begin to look at where can you begin to intervene. And I think the two way, major places you try to intervene are primary care, pediatricians' offices, OBGYN offices, and schools. That's where you can begin to put, if you're gonna have a system of care, you're beginning to have an input, you begin to have an effect on these kinds of issues. So schools and primary care. Healthy Steps is just one model, um, and we finance this across the state, about 20 practices across the state, um, partly to get the data to show that it works and to try to get this kind of thing paid for in Medicaid, which we're still struggling with. But what does it do? It puts a mental health specialist in a pediatric office of a certain number of clients, and that person works with the pediatrician to really work with all the families that come in, not people with identified necessarily mental health problems. It could be just stresses in the family. It could be that you know that maybe a parent has gone to jail in the family. Maybe a parent has died. Maybe a close member of the family has died. We know what the outcomes of those are if you don't kind of work with the family and help them get through it. And yet we don't do that. 
You know, if you come in with a cough or a cold, we're going to be sure to give you, <coughs> you know, um, maybe we'll give you an antibiotic, maybe we won't if we're careful about the antibiotics, but we'll give you something to help you with it. But if you come in and you're a mom and you say, you know, my, my son, you say, he's just, you know, he's having some trouble lately, what do you do with that? And often pediatricians' offices feel overwhelmed about what to do. Maybe it's something in the family, maybe it's something in the school, but if you don't pay attention to it early on, you're going to have the same thing. Ultimately, some of those um, ACEs things can end up being. So, you, you put this into practice, you, we know, and there have been studies that have shown that you get your back for your buck, but how do you get people to pay for it? That's some of the things we're going to struggle with. Why is it hard to pay for? Because you don't see anything immediate. So, just one little thought, if you think about it, if I'm a managed care company, I don't even know if that child, I hate to be brutal like this, but I don't even know if that little child's going to be in my managed care company by the time my managed, my uh, health plan, by the time they're 18. So what's my investment in making sure that they get better? It's investment in society, it's investment bigger, that's the actual payment return for an insurance company. Now they don't want to be mean about it, but they've got costs too, and they look at it. So all these things come into play and you're thinking about it. So just to keep that in mind, but this kind of stuff works, and we've got to push to be able to pay for it. Um, the results of healthy steps are there. Something else we do for the state, and this is really pediatricians, because if you're going to put this kind of thing in someone's practice, um, or even expect pediatricians to be doing screening, what if they need a consultation with a child psychiatrist? Well, you know how hard that is to get, because we have a shortage of child psychiatrists across the system. So we pay for this in the state. We have a system where we have child hubs. There's about five hubs. One's in New York City, one's up in Syracuse, um, I think one's in Rochester, where we have child psychiatrists who are available to be called by a pediatrician for a consultation. And they can get their phone consultation. We've expanded it now to be a teleconsultation so that you can have a telepsychiatry where they could actually see the child. And they also provide some training. But you don't have to get the training. If you're a pediatrician and you don't want the training, that's okay. If you do, we'll be glad to give it to you so you have some ideas. But what we provide is a consultation. And what we've expanded it to now is to work with um, um, OBGYN and other practitioners who moms who have maternal depression. Because again, the knowledge base out there of, you know, of physicians, whether they're primary care doctors or even psychiatrists, in terms of treating mothers with depression, pre and post postpartum, and it's, it's very tricky. And you know, sometimes she's always depressed, but I can't give antidepressants because they're in this trimester or whatever. You need to know all that. So we have experts now that can be on the phone that you can call. So this is statewide. It's modeled after a couple of other states have done this. It really works. And I think we have now about 3,500 pediatricians who use it pretty actively across the state. But any pediatrician can call in this. So school-based interventions. I'm just going to mention these quickly, but. Um, this is one that we supported some of the research with NYU and is now, and I think in about 30 schools in the city and growing, to something called Parent Corps, which is training parents um, in kindergarten. So all the parents, not just the parents that may be having, all the parents in, certain, in the kindergarten get a kind of basic training on social emotional wellness, how do you work with your kids, work with behavior problems, huge improvement. Basically, they show over time the kids do better and it costs less. So the, the number of visits to um, health and some of the, everything else is costless. Yet still, it's very hard. Now I have to give city credit for pushing this and thrive, and what it's doing in the city, because this kind of work, doing this early on in pre-K, is really um, critical. It has tremendous results. Um, I mentioned parents, parents how to work, how to work with their children on social parents. emotional wellness. But it's done with the teachers. So the teachers and the parents both work with that particular child on the parenting skills that will work with them. So it's really very effective, very effective. The promise zones, which I was talking about earlier with um, <coughs> Verna, this is something which we would love to expand. We have it across some schools. This is a kind of community thing where um, schools and a, um, a community-based agency, um, usually a social service agency, plus a school, plus a mental health agency, together with a school to talk about all the services they have and, the available, and how they can all work together for the families and the children that they have in the school that might be having some difficulties. It is amazing how people don't know what's out there and don't know the services in the community. You know, when we have, um, across the state, we have a pretty vibrant mobile crisis system where you can call um, and have someone come, you know, some places it's 
pretty timely, others it might take a while, but they can come and intervene and work with the child. It's amazing how people don't know about it. And it's amazing how schools don't know sometimes that there's a mental health service down the block. Um, the other thing we've been doing with the schools is building school-based clinics where it's appropriate. And mental health clinics in schools are really great because they do two things. One, they can serve the child and the family if you need to, but they also become consultants to the teachers. And you know, I met with the um, school superintendents um, about eight months ago. And for the first time in a long time, they really wanted these kinds of services. You know, in the past, when I first started in this business, you'd knock on the school doors and they'd say, they went on the space. It's very hard. Schools are always space. We can't have clinics. We can't. But I think the culture is changing now. So they're actually coming to us. In fact, we just had a big meeting upstate in one of the more rural areas where they're asking, and we've got a provider who's going to be putting a clinic in the schools. So this is great. And I think this will ultimately help. The other big thing about schools is the Mental Health Education Act. You know about this? That basically now it is law in New York State. Um, yeah, mental health education in schools, that you have to have mental health in the curriculum in your schools. And that was never there before. It was never there. Now, what I have to give the Commissioner of um, Education in the state enormous credit for this, because they didn't say, well, okay, we'll give you three lesson plans, and it'll be this kind of thing, and you can talk with this one about this or this about that, and we'll satisfy the requirement. They came up with a whole um, approach to mental and physical, um, social well-being and wellness in the schools, and guidance that they're sending out to all the schools. Now, if you know schools, a lot's up to the individual independent, somewhat independent district person, but a lot of the schools are picking this up. And they're really working not just on the classroom curriculum, but social-emotional wellness to deal with things like suicide, to deal with things like bullying, to deal with some of the crises that youth and their families face, working with parents, um, et cetera. So this is really, a, the guidance that's out there, the way the schools are approaching this is really very dramatic. So this is really, really good stuff. And those of, uh, so <clears throat> I have the experience with my uh, grandson who's gone to kindergarten for the first time. Yeah, he was in pre-K, now he's in kindergarten. And before he went to kindergarten, you know, grandma could, you know, grandma was the wisest thing on earth. You know, grandma said every, now it's teacher. I, I have been demoted. <laughs> I have been demoted. It's the teacher who knows What's right? The power of schools is enormous. And if we could really integrate a real thinking about mental health and mental wellness and social wellness in schools, just think about the effects on stigma, on the long-term way that people view mental illness, everything could kind of shift. So this is really cool. And I think if New York, the more we can get schools very involved in this, the better off. And it's fascinating because when you pass a law, people wake up a little bit and say, well, I have to do something. And some people have really embraced this in a way that I think will have great impact going into the future. The other thing to just talk about very briefly, because we've, and I know you guys have done, Vern has done tremendous work on this, is the suicide issues among youth. And it's, it's really very tragic <clears throat> that it's the second leading death, cause of death in this age group. So creating suicide safer schools, um, this is something the schools have been working with us on, and there's lots of things you can do. You can do education, you can do mental health first aid training, um, you can do post bench, which is what we call it when something very sad happens and a suicide does occur. So we have all of these things going on throughout the state. We have something called the Suicide um, Institute of Suicide Prevention, which we fund to do all this work with the schools. And we go out and we work with them. It's very successful. Um, I want to talk about one particular one, which is really kind of neat. This is something that goes on in Rochester and is now expanded to, I think it's almost 30 or 40 schools. There are 30 schools in the Rochester area which is teaching high school youth how to be peer um, workers for prevention, for social, emotional wellness, suicide prevention, bullying prevention. So it's a kind of peer program where you work with the students themselves. Very exciting. It's, very, it's kind of expensive because it involves training youth and what do youth do? They graduate. <laughs> so you train them and then the next group comes in you have to keep training them. But it's very, um, been very successful. It's evidence-based. They've done some really good research and it's something we would love to expand. But what it really means is teenagers talking to other teenagers about these issues. And you, uh, you all know who teenagers listen to most often is their peers. So this is a very exciting program which we want to kind of continue to spend. Um, on the collaborative care side, I think you probably, probably all know this, but this is just why it's so important. 
to have integrated collaborative care. So the other big piece, so there's that all that early prevention. The second level of prevention is finding problems when they're there that you wouldn't find if you didn't look for them. And that's the way I see it. so much of the work with screening for depression in primary care, screening for substance abuse in primary care, screening for anxiety in primary care. I mean, the numbers, which I'll go through, are, are, were, are horrific if you don't do it. 9%, somewhere of 8 to 9% of individuals in a primary care clinic have a diagnosable, treatable mental illness, 9 times out of 10 is depression, and up to 50, 40 to 50% of them still across the country don't get recognized and don't get treated. And the massive movement to recognize that, what does it do um, when you notice depression? Now, this, is, this particular slide isn't depression. It's just health conditions and you're generally feeling bad across New York State. But if you look at it for a minute, if you have poor mental health, that's the blue line. I mean, the red line, that other line is the amount of people who will have high blood pressure diabetes go sky high. When you have mental health problems, you, you have much more diabetes, et cetera. Medicaid population, the same thing. Blue line, if you have mental health, more hypertension, more diabetes, more everything. Sub, substance use, same thing. These, the numbers never, they just don't change. So what do you do about that? Well, you've got to find it if it's there. You know, people um, still, we unfortunately deal with stigma, et cetera, but if you don't look for these things, you don't find them. So that's a secondary prevention, is prevention of the long-term disability of depression. Worldwide, the biggest, almost taking it over now, the biggest cause of um, disability, heart disease, and what's number two? Depression. And depression's climbing up there. In the United States, it might even be depression's almost taking it over in the U.S. as being a major dis disabling illness. So if you don't pay attention to it, you're not only getting people ill, but you're having huge disability problems, huge disability costs. People's lives, moms who can't take care of their kids, you're having adults who can't work, who drop out of jobs, et cetera, huge disability problems. I can go through these numbers, they're just all dramatic, and the way we still, with everything we're doing, we're not quite there yet. But that's why collaborative care, looking for these things in primary care is so important, because that's where you're gonna find them. Disability, unipolar depression, huge. Um, <clears throat> so again, what I've just been talking about, because the high cost of disability is huge. The impact program, which I think probably you're all probably familiar with, which basically screens for primary care and depression and treats primary care and depression, and uh, in the primary care, treats why is that so important? Because lots of people aren't just going to go to a mental health clinic. And because they trust their primary care provider, they can feel connected to their primary care provider. The primary care provider knows how to treat depression and can do it there. A couple of things happen. One, you get the treatment done. But number two, you destigmatize depression. You can tell us you get treated for depression just like you get treated for everything else. And I think that's a critical, critical point. A lot of success with this. We know it works. You got to make it so you can pay for it. And we're in the process of struggling with this a lot in New York State. We're getting better at paying for it but it's still not as easy as it should be to pay for it because you're adding a cost on, it's true, you save all the money down the pipe, but convincing people of that is an interesting phenomenon. But the reality is that it still costs a little bit more, so it's hard to still get these programs paid for as adequately as they need to, but we're really doing much better in New York, and we're gonna to continue to fight for that. So collaborative care is all this kind of stuff that comes together within a primary care practice to treat depression, to treat anxiety disorders, and to treat and screen for substance use. You know, one of the views, even though I'm not substance use, you could have the Commission of Substance Use here talking, but it's the same phenomenon. It's missed. If you don't look for it, you don't see it, you don't treat it, and then it comes to you later on when people are very ill, et cetera. Okay, so collaborative care, we've had a number of projects over the years. Uh, the big one has been through the DISHRIP. You know, I'm not gonna go into the whole thing about DISHRIP, but it was a lot of money that came to New York State. And as part of the district, hospitals and providers got lots of money. They were all had to take a particular mental health, they had to pick at least one, we would have had it a lot more, but they had to pick at least one mental health project. What is exciting is that all of the primary care, so that does mean that this has started to get disseminated in a bigger way. And the district dollars helped to get started, but we're gonna have to make sure that um, the payers pay for this so in a way, and it's getting there. Um, <clears throat> Medicare now pays a little bit for co collaborative care. Um, the primary, um, the uh, 
commercial insurers are beginning to pay. Medicaid is paying for it in some ways. We're trying to get it more robust. But the reality is this kind of jump-started. A lot of this in primary care practices across the state, we now have to sustain it and let it continue to grow. Yeah. Mm. How would you like to describe that? Basically, New York, New York State put in a waiver. What a waiver means is you usually put in a waiver that says over time you will save some money. In the meantime, you get back money, which was taken to the feds for a variety of reasons without going in. So the feds took from New York State about $6 million. They pay it back. They have to. Well, maybe they will. Maybe they won't. You put in a waiver. They give you that money back on the idea that you're going to transform your system of care. And the big way that they were going to transform the system of care is to decrease avoidable admissions. Because what's your most expensive thing in the healthcare system is admissions. So this money was largely earmarked to decrease avoidable admissions. And there's an algorithm that tells you whether an admission is avoidable in Medicaid. Um, in that pool of dollars, you then had to come up with how are you going to do it. So obviously, there are lots of ways you can avoid high admissions for diabetes and hypertension. There's also ways you can avoid admissions because of behavioral health issues. And the question here is that if you can treat depression, how does this come in? If you can treat depression, you should be able to decrease the number of times that someone gets admitted for their diabetes because maybe they're not depressed anymore, so maybe now they're dealing with their diabetes better. But money flows to various projects, various ways at hospitals. Not a lot of it truthfully flowed to mental health. Um, the big number that you uh, there, I can know, tell you, people, not in the billions, let me put it that way. It was um, uh, a couple hundred million, a couple hundred million maybe top. There was an algorithm so that first, you know, it was primary care, and then it, you know, it was health home, primary care, mental health, like it went down sort of like a cascade. Um, in importance and patients were attributed to each of those areas and really patients couldn't be attributed to mental health organizations and so they got no money and neither did the community-based organizations because in the algorithm no patient lives were actually attributed to them and you got money based on how many people were in were attributed to you and so they were essentially left out of the game. Re now, you see, what's, what's fascinating here is that Vern is absolutely right about the way they did it. New York designed it. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't. So it was designed with a, a little bit of a blank spot here. And when we protested a lot for mental health, the issue was, well, they're going to realize that they can only get good outcomes if they invest in mental health. And we said, <laughs> you know, really? <laughs> you know, this isn't going to happen. So the argument back was that they realized the next slide, which I'm going to show you, which was this, let me show you this one, which is data. Oh, I'm sorry, it's hard to read. Which is data they had at the beginning, and they still didn't invest in mental health. Basically, avoidable admissions. Medicaid, avoidable admissions. Half of the avoidable admissions for Medicaid are individuals with mental health and substance use being admitted to medical services. A quarter to mental, mental health and mental health patients being admitted to mental health so services, a quarter substance abuse being admitted to substance use. The very thing they're trying to cut down on has mental health written all over it, and yet the way they decided over time to apportion kind of left mental health quite seriously on the side. And No, no, that would have been cool. If we'd gotten that, I can tell you, we would have had. But the reality is it didn't. And the reality, now, again, there's need all over the place. So I'm not saying that they didn't put some of this money to need that was there and that had to go to. And I can understand the way they're thinking. But what they didn't do is what we're talking about here, just trying to get them to put mind and body together. And if you want your best outcomes, I don't think all the 6.4 billion should have come, but I think maybe, you know, 20, 25% should have come. Why? Because we know that it has this kind of an impact on what's going on. There was a, a great deal of investment in primary care, is that correct? Yes. And, and you have a lot of programs uh, infusing mental health uh, awareness into primary care services. So maybe indirectly or... Some of 
of it did get in. Some of it did, and it got in through, through that route. So in that respect, yes, there was some. The, um, <clears throat> the, the issue here is the spread of it, because even the $6.2 billion, some of it did go to primary care, but quite honestly, even with the apportionment, exactly how the dollars went, a lot of it still ended up flushing into hospitals and hospital there reimbursement. There was no consistent algorithm for how the hospital network. So because the only people who could get the money had to pass the financial burden test, the only organizations that could pass the financial burden test were hospitals and one health center that we're not really sure where they got all their money. And so the way that it happened then is the way that it was distributed to primary care, there was no formula. So a primary care organization could be in three hospital networks, have the same amount of attributed patients with each and get three different amounts of money because there was nothing set. It was all left up to how the hospitals decided to distribute it across their networks and how much they did or didn't give to even the mental health providers. And, the and then health. even each of those providers could make up their own mind, I mean, true within their system, how they were going to spend the money. So, so it wasn't laid out. To the floor in the auditorium today, I would advise you very strongly to go and try to read anything you can about the Bishop system in New York State. It's a very interesting experiment. <laughs> it's going to be evaluated over time. But I just wanted you to be aware of the complexity of the system. Yeah, it's very complex. Now, the first outcome data that's out there does show that the avoidable admissions kind of have gone down. Um, but the bar, I forget the percentage they had to bring them down by, but the bar wasn't that high. But, the bar, but they have come down. They have had an impact. They have decreased a certain number of admissions. And they have put certain things in place. Um, whether or not it's, we would all agree that it's worth the $6.4 billion that came to the state to do that, I don't know. I mean, that will come out in some of the evaluation. But there have been some, you know, reasonably good outcomes. I can't say there haven't been. Our, point on the mental health side is that this was an opportunity. And it wasn't just mental health. It was an opportunity for all the social determinants. You know, if you think about it, it was an opportunity for some money to come in where hospitals, and they did do some of this, could partner with social service agencies, could partner with uh, food providers, could partner with um, various groups in the community that we know keep people healthy and keep them healthy, but traditionally um, healthcare systems have not partnered with them. And some did, but sadly, probably not enough. So, for example, if you wanted to, Meals on Wheels, the kinds of things that delivers food to the elderly, this kind of stuff. You know, all that could have been increased with some of this money to help decrease the number of individuals coming into hospitals who need that kind of stuff. But not much of it moved that way. Some of it did, in all honesty, but some of it didn't. So DISHRIP is an interesting experiment, and it's had, um, there's been waivers like that across the country. There's other states you can look at, too, to see what they've done. Okay, so I want to talk for just a minute about this. Um, about the, what, what time do we Okay, five minutes. So I'm going to go quickly. But one about the seriously mentally ill, because this is another, um, you know, this group was unfortunately largely not too much involved in the district, which I think was kind of sad. But the seriously mentally ill, by and large, have a life expectancy which is 20 to 25 years less than the general population. And the biggest issue is the comorbid not suicide, it's a comorbid mental problem. And the biggest issue is smoking, something we just haven't been able to crack. A lot of the things that have been working in the general population haven't been as successful with the seriously mentally ill, um, but also some of the drugs that we give to the seriously mentally ill cause what we call metabolic syndrome, which can cause uh, diabetes, et cetera. But they could be treated if the seriously mentally ill get treated. So the reverse of everything I've been talking about, about infusing um, not the reverse, but the mirror image of infusing mental health into primary care is making primary care as important in the clinic and the treatment system that we have in mental health. So, for example, what we're pushing every hospital to do is when you leave that acute care hospital, you shouldn't just make sure they have an appointment with a mental health provider. You should make sure they're going to get to see their PCP too. And you should make sure they're connected to a PCP. That's something we didn't routinely do. You know, I mean, when, when our clinics, yes, we tried to make sure that they made a visit once a year, but my clinic staff, most of our clinics weren't that um, into making sure that, are you taking your blood pressure meds? Um, what about your diabetes? Are you taking this? Do you have any problems? We need to do that as much on our side as we're asking the primary care doctors to be doing on their side. 
So again, it's that kind of integration. And then the other thing is we have a major push on, we're still struggling with how to deal with smoking. It's just not, um, we've lowered it, it's interesting, we've lowered it a little bit in our um, mental, in our clinics in the state system. We're trying to use some of the things we've done to help the other clinics. It's a lot of persistence, it's working a lot with our clients, but unfortunately it's probably something physiological too that makes them more susceptible to kind of continuing to smoke. But it's been very hard and huge, huge medical problems. Okay. Um, I want to just spend a little time on this one because I think this is the kind of thing that if we get it right can have a huge impact on that curve of functional disability um, for the seriously mentally ill. On Track New York is a program where individuals who have their first psychotic episode I get a team to work with them. And the team works on a couple of things. It works on controlling their psychotic symptoms to whatever extent the client kind of wants and controls. It's very client focused. But it, it works with the families and supports. And it helps people stay in school and stay in a job. The two most important things that happen to the serious mentally ill is they have a first break. Remember, the vast majority of serious mental illness appears before the age of 21. So you have a first break. The time between that first break in the past and getting actual really helpful treatment would be four to five to six years. During that period of time, what happens? You drop out of school, you lose your job, your family gets frustrated, you begin to get that kind of social isolation and functional disability. What this does is it breaks into that trajectory. So it's a kind of prevention. In other words, you now know you have an illness, but what are you preventing? You're preventing a long-term disability. These individuals so far in the program 70 to 75 percent have maintained either in their job or at um, work. Doesn't mean maybe they get hospitalized because you know it's a relapsing illness sometimes. Doesn't mean that they're totally symptom free because sometimes you can work or go to school and still have some symptoms, but you are staying on track in the community. And that's so critical. When I talked about our state hospitals in the past, that's not what we did. It's why I have so many individuals for those long years in my state hospitals because this kind of support wasn't there. And now those individuals who unfortunately have become institutionalized. You can live a very full life being schizophrenic, being bipolar, et cetera, but you need the right supports. You can have a family, you can do what everybody else does, but you need the right supports at the right time in your life. And you may need them, some need them long-term, some shorter, depends on the kind of illness you have. But you need it and you need to stay connected to your supports, to your social supports, and to the things that you want out of life. And that's what First On Track does. We're beginning, we now have these programs pretty much maybe almost three quarters of the state so that anyone who has a first episode has an opportunity to get in uh, to this kind of program. And we're gonna be expanding it in the future to work with individuals with bipolar disorder and severe depression. Um, you know, this is very focused on the particular diagnosis and I think it has to be in a way because of um, the symptoms and the kinds of things that individuals who have psychotic episodes go through. But you can modify it, fix it to other kinds of early onset illnesses. So that once you get that early onset, once you recognize it and it's there, you jump on it. But you jump on it in a way that's very client friendly. It knows what the individual wants, not the way we used to do, which was take your meds, just take your meds, just take your meds. That doesn't work. If you know a diabetic who's 16 or 17, that doesn't work either. It doesn't work that you can tell kids or just take the meds or just do this. You have to kind of give them the hope, the vision of what their life can be in the future, and you have to help them get there. And that's what this program does. It's very effective. The zero suicide, I'm not going to really talk too much about except to say that we're doing it across the state. Um, it's, it's a major initiative, and um, it's working with the meta. Zero suicide focuses on the providers, because I don't think we're doing as good a job as we need to be doing. And there's a lot of other prevention, but this focuses on providers and how we deal with suicide. I think I'll kind of, we're getting to the end here. One more word just about um, the seriously mentally ill. Um, when you talk about um, long-term healthy individuals with serious mental illness, just like I said with that early group, what do you need? You need job skills and you need a good safe place to live. And you need a connection with your family and your support. And it's not easy to do, but it's what we're in the business of doing. So it's a lot of work that goes on throughout the state system on helping individuals get jobs, maintain jobs, we're tremendously low in that number. We've had about 18% of our seriously mentally ill working. It should be like 60%. So we're constantly going up that, um, pushing that envelope to get it done. But it's a critical thing. And we are now are working a lot with supported work around housing so that individuals can live in the community. 
And sometimes individuals will relapse in the community, and I know you see that in the newspapers, and it can be very troubling. But you know, um, illness, all chronic illnesses relapse. Um, and I, 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 I don't say that lightly, because I know that sometimes our clients can do things that can be very disturbing to others, but the vast majority of our clients live in the community, individuals with serious mental illness are doing poorly. And they're living full lives just like everybody else is. And that's the goal you want. It doesn't mean that sometimes there aren't individuals who have more trouble with that than others. But any illness, chronic illness, can um, huge cost of congestive heart failure in the medical side. The biggest reason? Because people don't follow their meds, just like that sometimes happens with psych patients. Why don't they follow the meds? Because they're not very fun meds to take if you have congestive heart failure. So people don't take them. Why don't people sometimes take their psych meds? Because they're not such fun meds to take, and it's not so easy to take. So I think what you have to just keep in mind that we're dealing here with individuals who can live full lives, and it's our job to make sure they're safe. It's safe, but to really make sure that they have the opportunity to do that. So I guess I'll stop here because I probably I'm not going to talk too long. But I'm here for questions. Thank you. Thank you. I know there's some folks around here who is this on? Yeah. Oh, okay, good. Um, I would like to know how much money has been allocated for aftercare um, for, I would say, mental patients who are like living in the community and housing. There seems to be a problem with uh, follow up with the social workers to check on uh, clients are now housed and mm -hmm. it caused um, a bit of disruption in these apartments. Yeah, it, you know, it depends on the, um, uh, I, I can't give you the exact number of the budget, but let me say, we have different levels of housing. Yeah. So we have, and each of the levels of housing has different levels of support. So um, there is some housing where um, it, it, it's congregate in, in the sense that all the units of the housing, all the apartments are in one building. And there we have 24-hour people who are there 24 hours a day. And then we have something called scatter site apartments, which might be more what you're talking about, which are apartments that are um, in the community, but they could be in anybody's apartment building or anywhere. All of those individuals have case managers. They have people who visit them, et cetera, not every day. Um, if they have recently left our state hospitals um, and when they need the more intensive work, they get it intensive when it starts now. I know if you look at some, and you've probably all seen some of the um, newspaper articles. There was one from the adult homes that was pretty dramatic. Uh, they, many of those individuals had people following them. It becomes a very tricky thing about when you, when you intervene with someone in terms of their civil rights to say no. Um, so I don't want to go into this too much, but, but it's, a, it's, a, it's a really important issue to just keep in mind. You know, um, the, uh, on the medical side, when I was in the hospitals, we would have individuals who would refuse blood transfusions because of their religious beliefs, which they were entitled to do. And sometimes they would get very, very sick, and sometimes they would even die, and they had the right to do that. When, our, when my seriously mentally ill patients refuse something, which they have the right to do, um, other things happen. And sometimes there are things like their apartments get really disorganized, yeah. or sometimes they can be disruptive in the community. Um, it's our job to work as much with them as possible so that they, that doesn't happen. But uh, with all the best efforts sometimes, um, if someone is refusing, when do you draw the line to take away someone's liberty and say, I'm sorry, this person has to go into an acute care hospital? It's never an easy decision to make. I used to do this work. I worked on one of the first outreach programs in the city called Project Help, where we went out and we worked with the homeless in the uh, 80s, 70s, 80s, when there were homeless all over the city. And I can tell you what our job was largely was to help move people that they needed to go from the street to the hospital. So we would go out and evaluate and talk to people. And it was one of the hardest jobs I ever had because you have to make a choice here for individuals who maybe were sitting in someone's doorstep and nobody likes. Sometimes have someone sitting in their doorstep who looks a little dirty and, you know, do I, do I have a right to say to them you can't be there? You've got to come into a hospital. When do I make that decision? When do I pull that switch and say, I'm going to take away your liberties? It's not an easy thing to do. 
has to be very, very careful. So there's no easy answer is what I'm saying. I do believe, however, that long term it has to be bigger than that individual. And that's why I spend so much time talking about um, the On Track New York. Because what, what we haven't done is done enough of the work with individuals earlier in their lives so they don't get to the point where um, the system in some ways has failed them and that they are still not, um, they're not engaged in the community anymore. Maybe they're sleeping on the street or they're not, in a, they're not doing well in their apartment. Um, sometimes the illness is so severe that it runs ahead of you. I know that too as a doc. I know sometimes with the best efforts you can't stop everything. You can't stop medical illnesses either. You can't stop it. But we have to get better and better at the community support. I think if we get better and better, there'll be less and less of that. I'm not saying there'll be never be it. The other thing is there was a very interesting um, work that was done um, post uh, uh, no, um World War II someplace in, in Italy called Trieste. Anybody else here heard of the Trieste experiment? The Trieste experiment closed an 800-bed hospital in an area of Italy where they probably didn't need 800 beds. They just closed it, and they set up a whole community system within that somewhat enclosed community in Italy um, where they had all the things that we're trying to put in place that are easy here. You know, easy access to a crisis respite bed, easy access to a bed if you're feeling a little bit upset, this, that, and the other thing. But they got rid of the whole state hospital system, and they got rid of almost all the inpatient beds. So they don't even have those anymore, acute care. They just have kind of places where people go and restabilize. The whole community... The whole community kind of got around all those individuals also and supported them and understood what was going on. And they have an incredible record. You know, mental illness is mental illness. Some of it's genetic and some of it's pretty much you can track what it is. Tremendous record of those individuals in that community not getting um, hospitalized, being able to live successfully in the community. Some of those that are more challenged and more impaired than others. Um, maybe they spend more time kind of hanging out on the streets, but they don't become the kind of some of the things we see here. Tremendous results. What's fascinating is no place else in Italy picked it up, and no place else here has picked it up. So it's fascinating these pockets of this kind of experience can be there. It takes a whole culture to run it. So I'm not so, um, I guess what I'm trying to pitch here a little bit to some of the younger people here, that your culture drives a little bit of this. The way you see the mentally ill drives it in more subtle ways than we sometimes think. And the way we sometimes are not, we're a very interesting culture. You know, we sometimes we're not quite as supportive as some other cultures can be in terms of family and connectedness and people coming to New York when the rest of their family is someplace else and they have serious mental illness and they get lost and disconnected and before you know it, they're homeless and on the streets or maybe in a shelter. Uh, you know, there's lots of societal things that also impinge on mental illness. You have to just keep all that in mind. That's all I'm saying. And when cultures embrace this in a different way, now I know it's small, you're going to say, well, that's not New York City. And I agree with you, it's not New York City. But when cultures embrace it in a little bit of a way, we can get somewhat different outcomes. We always have to be thoughtful about that in terms of the way we plan and design and think about individuals um, with serious mental illness. Because uh, the illness, unfortunately, is probably not going to go away. You know, schizophrenia is a certain percentage of the population will always be here. Okay. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> yes. Um, thank you so much for the talk. It's very um, educational, very informative. Um, so I think that you touched on so many different points. I haven't heard you speak about social media. I feel that the state needs to put a lot of emphasis on companies to invest more in uh, wellness and you know mental health, particularly uh, Facebook, Twitter, Twitter, YouTube, Google, Apple. All these companies probably do have some kind of wellness program, but I feel that from a state perspective, there needs to be intervention particularly when it comes to corporate social investment and how they are showing that. Um, what is the state's stance on that? Is there a stance and where are we going forward? Yeah, no, I think you're right. I think we need to invest much more in it than we have. Traditionally, we haven't done as much. I think um, I've been on a couple of things. With Google is developing a couple. Of, they've done some work on um, suicide prevention. And I think they're going to be um, something else I'm going to them with where we serve as advisors to some of what they come out. So I'm going to be on a panel with Google, I think it's a couple of weeks from now. I'm talking about, um, I can't remember what this one is, but it might be bullying or something like that, where we talk with them about how to work on that. So we haven't been doing it as a state as a, a separate thing, but we have been involved in working with the companies. And I think that they can be much more um, assertive and aggressive about doing this kind of work. And there is an interest in some of them in doing it. Um, I think that they have realized some of the problems that have happened 
on social media, et cetera. So I think that there's more of an interest. We do have a text line. We have a suicide text line, um, crisis text line, not suicide, crisis text line, which the state, which we have funded, which is out there, um, which basically um, anybody can use. And basically you can text if you're in a crisis. So we're beginning to look more at technology. We need to look more at it in terms of social media and the availability of those things. I think we're a little behind in doing it, um, but I think we're kind of getting there. Um, in terms of the treatment part, we've done a lot with telemedicine and telepsychiatry in terms of um, increasing the, making the regs more workable and making it so you can get paid for it. Um, we're doing a lot of um, stuff. There's some very innovative stuff that we're looking at from Columbia in terms of uh, tablets kinds of things that can work for substance use. Um, you, know, you check in and you can do that kind of thing. So there's on that side. And then on the social media side, we're all working with the companies. But, but no, we're not specifically heading too much. You're right. And it's something we should look at. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I'm Vicki Miller, I'm the Deputy Director of the CIMH. Um, I, you know, I really appreciated your uh, focus on early intervention and integrated care. I think that's so important. Um, I was wondering, you know, as you roll out these programs across the state, what are some of the models or strategies you guys have found most effective or make the biggest difference in getting evidence-based programs to stick? Because you know, mental health programs oftentimes are so complicated. It's different than just health promotion. It's, it involves a lot of training and quality assurance. And so, how have you guys managed that? And, and you know, are there specific models that we should be looking at? Yeah, I think that you know, there's different ways you can do it. Um, some, a big issue for any sustainability is how you pay for it. To be quite honest, the vast majority of very innovative programs that have come out have come out on grant funding or funding streams that are separate from the mainstream healthcare funding. So a big challenge once you know you want to spread it, like even first on track New York, is that we've done a lot of work in making half of that program payable through various ways to build Medicaid or commercial insurers. But if you can't pay for it, it becomes very hard to sustain it. The second is getting a certain champions out there. So often we will go to a county that has a particular interest and you can use them to work with you. But paying for it is, is a critical point. The training part, in my experience, is what we've learned is that one-shot trainings or um, maybe a training for a week goes only so far. What you need is a sustainable coaching phenomena. So one of the experiences that we've had with one of the best training approaches has been something which uses what they call an echo kind of model, which is basically you do your basic training and then you have via um, telecommunication um, weekly conferences with the group that you've trained. So they call in, they may present a case, um, that kind of thing. They've done this with geriatrics. We're doing it with geriatrics in nursing homes. Um, others have done it in primary care. So how you spread the learning has to be more, a lot of the one-shot trainings, they have an impact, but, they, but it dissipates over time. And it's hard to reproduce for the next generation of people who come in. So you need to be able to have, um, Ongoing, that kind of training, booster training, um, you know, coaching training, all that costs a certain amount of money. But if you can get those funding streams, that's much more sustainable. Um, so I think people want to continue them. Honestly, the biggest thing is to get it paid for in some kind of funding stream that at least pays for enough of it to let it grow. And that's why we've been able to grow um, first on track because we put some of it out of just grant money and is now being paid for out of Medicaid and all the other intervention stuff we want to get paid for too. Our my experience is that by and large, providers will do it if, and they're not, they're not being mean about this. I mean, they, they, they can't be doing lots of stuff they don't get paid for because then they can't do what they have to do. So if you can get the payment out there, people tend to want to do it. But then the training has to be boosted. You can't just kind of think you train once and it works. It has to be an ongoing kind of learning phenomenon. Yeah, you have a question? Yeah. 